8.5.5 Anarchists in the Italian Factory Occupations After the end of the First World War, there was a massive radicalization across Europe and the world. Union membership exploded, with strikes, demonstrations, and agitation reaching massive levels. This was partly due to the war, partly to the apparent success of the Russian Revolution. This enthusiasm for the Russian Revolution even reached individualist anarchists like Joseph Labadzi, who, like many other anti-capitalists, saw, open quote, the red in the east giving hope of a brighter day, and the Bolsheviks as making laudable efforts to at least try some way out of the hell of industrial slavery, end quote. Across Europe, anarchist ideas became more popular and anarcho-syndicalist unions grew in size. For example, in Britain, the ferment produced the shop stewards movement and the strikes on Clyde's side. Germany saw the rise of IWW-inspired industrial unionism and a libertarian form of Marxism called council communism. Spain saw a massive growth in the anarcho-syndicalist CNT. In addition, it also, unfortunately, saw the rise and growth of both social democratic and communist parties. Italy was no exception. In turn, a new rank-and-file movement was developing. This movement was based around the international commissions, elected ad hoc grievance committees. These new organizations were based directly on the group of people who worked together in a particular workshop, with a mandated and recallable shop steward elected for each group of 15 to 20 or so workers. The assembly of all the shop stewards in a given plant then elected the internal commission for that facility, which was directly and constantly responsible to the body of shop stewards, which was called the Factory Council. Between November 1918 and March 1919, the internal commissions had become a national issue within the trade union movement. On February 20, 1919, the Italian Federation of Metal Workers, FIOM, won a contract providing for the election of internal commissions in the factories. The workers subsequently tried to transform these organs of workers' representation into factory councils with a managerial function. By May Day 1919, the internal commissions, open quote, were becoming the dominant force within the metalworking industry and the unions were in danger of becoming marginal administrative units. Behind these alarming developments in the eyes of reformists lay the libertarians, end quote. By November 1919, the internal commissions of Turin were transformed into factory councils. The movement in Turin is usually associated with the weekly L'Ordine Nuovo, the New Order, which first appeared on May 1, 1919. As Daniel Guérin summarizes, it was, open quote, edited by a left socialist, Antonio Gramsci, assisted by a professor of philosophy at Turin University with anarchist ideas, writing under the pseudonym of Carlo Petri, and also of a whole nucleus of Turin libertarians. In the factories, the Ordine Nuovo group was supported by a number of people, especially the anarcho-syndicalist militants of the metal trades, Pietro Ferrero and Maurizio Garino. The Manifesto of Ordine Nuovo was signed by socialists and libertarians together, agreeing to regard the factory councils as, open quote, organs suited to future communist management of both the individual factory and the whole society, end quote. The developments in Turin should not be taken in isolation. All across Italy, workers and peasants were taking action. In late February 1920, a rash of factory occupations broke out in Liguria, Piemont, and Naples. In Liguria, the workers occupied the metal and shipbuilding plants in Sestri Ponente, Cornigliano, and Campi after a breakdown of pay talks. For up to four days, under syndicalist leadership, they ran the plants through factory councils. During this period, the Italian syndicalist union, USI, grew in size to around 800,000 members, and the influence of the Italian anarchist union, UAI, with its 20,000 members and daily paper, Humanita Nova, grew correspondingly. As the Welsh Marxist historian Gwyn A. Williams points out, open quote, Anarchists and revolutionary syndicalists were the most consistently and totally revolutionary group on the left, the most obvious feature of the history of syndicalism and anarchism in 1919-1920, rapid and virtually continuous growth. The syndicalists, above all, captured militant working-class opinion, which the socialist movement was utterly failing to capture." End quote. In Turin, libertarians, open quote, 
worked with FIOM and had been heavily involved in the Ordine Nuovo campaign from the beginning, end quote. Unsurprisingly, Ordone Nuovo was denounced as syndicalist by other socialists. It was the anarchists and syndicalists who first raised the idea of occupying workplaces. Malatesta was discussing the idea in Umanita Nova in March 1920. In his words, open quote, General strikes of protest no longer upset anyone. One must seek something else. We put forward an idea. Takeover of factories. The method certainly has a future because it corresponds to the ultimate ends of the workers' movement and constitutes an exercise preparing one for the ultimate act of expropriation. End quote. In the same month, during open quote, a strong syndicalist campaign to establish councils and Mila, Armando Borghi, anarchist secretary of the USI, called for mass factory occupations. In Turin, the re-election of workshop commissars was just ending in a two-week orgy of passionate discussion, and workers caught the fever. Factory councils commissars began to call for occupations. Indeed, the council movement outside Turin was essentially anarcho-syndicalist. Unsurprisingly, the secretary of the syndicalist metal workers urged support for the Turin councils because they represented anti-bureaucratic direct action, aimed at control of the factory and could be the first cells of syndicalist industrial unions. The syndicalist congress voted to support the councils. Malatesta supported them as a form of direct action guaranteed to generate rebelliousness. Humanita Nova and Guerra di Classe, paper of the USI, became almost as committed to the councils as Lordini Nuovo and the Turin edition of Avanti." End quote. The upsurge in militancy soon provoked an employer counter-offensive. The boss's organization denounced the factory councils and called for mobilization against them. Workers were rebelling and refusing to follow the boss's orders. Indiscipline was rising in the factories. They won state support for the enforcement of the existing industrial regulations. The national contract won by the FIOM in 1919 had provided that the internal commissions were banned from the shop floor and restricted to non-working hours. This meant that the activities of the shop stewards movement in Turin, such as stopping work to hold shop steward elections, were in violation of the contract. The movement was essentially being maintained through mass insubordination. The bosses used this infringement of the agreed contract as the means combating the factory councils in Turin. The showdown with the employers arrived in April, when a general assembly of shop stewards at Fiat called for sit-in strikes to protest the dismissal of several shop stewards. In response, the employers declared a general lockout. The government supported the lockout with a mass show of force and troops occupied the factories and mounted machine guns posts at them. When the shop stewards movement decided to surrender on the immediate issues in dispute after two weeks on strike, the employers responded with demands that the shop stewards councils be limited to non-working hours in accordance with the FIOM national contract, and that managerial control be reimposed. These demands were aimed at the heart of the factory council system, and Turin labor movement responded with a massive general strike in defense of it. In Turin, the strike was total, and it soon spread throughout the region of Piemont and involved 500,000 workers at its height. The Turin strikers called for the strike to be extended nationally, and, being mostly led by socialists, they turned to the CGL trade union and socialist party leaders who rejected their call. The only support for the Turin general strike came from unions that were mainly under anarcho-syndicalist influence, such as the Independent Railway and the Maritime Workers' Unions. The syndicalists were the only ones to move, end quote. The railway workers in Pisa and Florence refused to transport troops who were being sent to Turin. There were strikes all around Genoa, among dock workers, and in workplaces where the USI was a major influence. So, in spite of being, open quote, betrayed and abandoned by the whole socialist movement, the April movement still found popular support with actions either directly led or indirectly inspired by anarcho-syndicalists. In Turin itself, the anarchists and syndicalists were threatening to cut the council movement out from under Gramsci and the Ordine Nuovo group, end quote. 
Eventually, the CGL leadership settled the strike on terms that accepted the employer's main demand for limiting the shop stewards' councils to non-working hours. Though the councils were now much reduced in activity and shop floor presence, they would yet see a resurgence of their position during the September factory occupations. The anarchists, open quote, accused the socialists of betrayal. They criticized what they believed was a false sense of discipline that had bound socialists to their own cowardly leadership. They contrasted the discipline that placed every movement under the calculations, fears, mistakes, and possible betrayals of the leaders to the other discipline of the workers of Sestri Ponente who struck in solidarity with Churin, the discipline of the railway workers who refused to transport security forces to Churin, and the anarchists and members of the Unione Sindicale who forgot considerations of party and sect to put themselves at the disposition of the Torinesi." End quote. Sadly, this top-down discipline of the socialists and their unions would be repeated during the factory occupations, with terrible results. In September 1920, there were large-scale stay-in strikes in Italy in response to an owner wage cut and lockout. Open quote, Central to the climate of the crisis was the rise of the syndicalists. In mid-August, the USI metal workers called for both unions to occupy the factories and called for a preventive occupation against lockouts. The USI saw this as the expropriation of the factories by the metal workers, which must be defended by all necessary measures, and saw the need to call the workers of other industries into battle." End quote. Indeed, open quote, if the FIOM had not embraced the syndicalist idea of an occupation of factories to counter an employer's lockout, the USI may well have won significant support from the politically active working class of Turin." End quote. These strikes began in the engineering factories and soon spread to railways, road transport, and other industries, with peasants seizing land. The strikers, however, did more than just occupy their workplaces. They placed them under workers' self-management. Soon, over 500,000 strikers were at work, producing for themselves. Eruko Malatesta, who took part in these events, writes, open quote, The metal workers started the movement over wage rates. It was a strike of a new kind. Instead of abandoning the factories, the idea was to remain inside without working. Throughout Italy, there was a revolutionary fervor among the workers and soon the demands changed their characters. Workers thought that the moment was ripe to take possession once and for all the means of production. They armed for defense and began to organize production on their own. It was the right of property abolished in fact. It was a new regime, a new form of social life that was being ushered in. And the government stood by because it felt impotent to offer opposition." End quote. Daniel Guérin provides a good summary of the extent of the movement. Open quote. The management of the factories was conducted by technical and administrative workers' committees. Self-management went quite a long way. In the early period, assistance was obtained from the banks, but when it was withdrawn, the self-management system issued its own money to pay the workers' wages. Very strict self-discipline was required, the use of alcoholic beverages forbidden, and armed patrols were organized for self-defense. Very close solidarity was established between the factories under self-management. Ores and coal were put into a common pool and shared out equitably." End quote. Italy was, open quote, paralyzed with half a million workers occupying their factories and raising red and black flags over them. The movement spread throughout Italy, not only in the industrial heartland around Milan, Turin, and Genoa, but also in Rome, Florence, Naples, and Palermo. The militants of the USI were certainly in the forefront of the movement. While Umanita Nova argued that the movement is very serious and we must do everything we can to channel it towards a massive extension. The persistent call of the USI was for an extension of the movement to the whole of industry to institute their expropriating general strike." End quote. Railway workers influenced by the libertarians refused to transport troops. Workers went on strike against the orders of the reformist unions, and peasants occupied the land. The anarchists wholeheartedly supported the movement, unsurprisingly as the open quote, Occupation of the factories and the land suited perfectly our program of action. End quote. Luigi Fabri described the occupations as having open quote, 
revealed a power in the proletariat of which it had been unaware hitherto. End quote. However, after four weeks of occupation, the workers decided to leave the factories. This was because of the actions of the Socialist Party and the reformist trade unions. They opposed the movement and negotiated with the state for a return to normality in exchange for a promise to extend workers' control legally in association with the bosses. The question of revolution was decided by a vote of the CGL National Council in Milan on April 10th and 11th without consulting the syndicalist unions after the Socialist Party leadership refused to decide one way or the other. Needless to say, this promise of workers' control was not kept. The lack of independent interfactory organization made workers dependent on trade union bureaucrats for information on what was going on in other cities, and they used that power to isolate factories, cities, and factories from each other. This led to a return to work, open quote, in spite of the opposition of individual anarchists dispersed among the factories, end quote. The local syndicalist union confederations could not provide the necessary framework for a fully coordinated occupation movement as the reformist unions refused to work with them, and although the anarchists were a large minority, they were still a minority. Open quote. At the Interproletarian Convention held on September 12th, in which the Unione Anarchia the Railway Men's and Maritime Workers Union participated, the Syndicalist Union decided that we cannot do it ourselves without the Socialist Party and the CGL, protested against the counter-revolutionary vote of Milan, declared it minoritarian, arbitrary, and null, and ended by launching new, vague, but ardent calls to action." End quote. Maltesta addressed the workers of one of the factories at Milan. He argued that, open quote, those who celebrate the agreement signed at Rome between the Confederazione and the capitalists as a great victory of yours are deceiving you. The victory in reality belongs to Diolitti, to the government and the bourgeoisie, who are saved from the precipice over which they were hanging. During the occupation, the bourgeoisie trembled. The government was powerless to face the situation. Therefore, to speak of victory when the Roman agreement throws you back under bourgeois exploitation, which you could have got rid of, is a lie. If you give up the factories, do this with the conviction of having lost a great battle and with the firm intention to resume the struggle on the first occasion and to carry it on in a thorough way. Nothing is lost if you have no illusion about the deceiving character of the victory. The famous decree on the control of factories is a mockery, because it tends to harmonize your interests and those of the bourgeois, which is like harmonizing the interests of the wolf and the sheep. Don't believe those of your leaders who make fools of you by adjourning the revolution from day to day. You yourselves must make the revolution when an occasion will offer itself, without waiting for orders which never come, or which come only to enjoin you to abandon action. Have confidence in yourselves, have faith in your future, and you will win." End quote. Malatesta was proven correct. With the end of the occupations, the only victors were the bourgeoisie and the government. Soon, the workers would face fascism, but first, in October 1920, open quote, after the factories were evacuated, the government, obviously knowing who the real threat was, arrested the entire leadership of the USI and UAI. The socialists did not respond, and more or less ignored the persecution of the libertarians until the spring of 1921, when the aged Malatesta and other imprisoned anarchists mounted a hunger strike from their cells in Milan." End quote. They were acquitted after a four-day trial. The events of 1920 show four things. Firstly, that workers can manage their own workplaces successfully by themselves, without bosses. Secondly, on the need for anarchists to be involved in the labor movement. Without the support of the USI, the Turin movement would have been even more isolated than it was. Thirdly, anarchists need to be organized to influence the class struggle. The growth of the UAI and USI in terms of both influence and size indicates the importance of this. Without the anarchists and syndicalists raising the idea of factory occupations and supporting the movement, it is doubtful that it would have been as successful and widespread as it was. Lastly, that socialist organizations structured in a hierarchical fashion do not produce a revolutionary membership. By continually looking to leaders, the movement was crippled and could not develop to its full potential. This period of Italian history explains the growth of fascism in Italy. As Tobias Apse points out, open quote, 
The rise of fascism in Italy cannot be detached from the events of the Bieno Rosso, the two red years of 1919 and 1920 that preceded it. Fascism was a preventive counter-revolution, launched as a result of the failed revolution." End quote. The term preventive counter-revolution was originally coined by the leading anarchist Luigi Fabri, who correctly described fascism as, open quote, the organization and agent of the violent armed defense of the ruling class against the proletariat, which, to their mind, has become unduly demanding, united, and intrusive, end quote. The rise of fascism confirmed Malatesta's warning at the time of the factory occupations, open quote, if we do not carry on to the end, we will pay with tears of blood for the fear we now instill in the bourgeoisie, end quote. The capitalists and rich landowners backed the fascists in order to teach the working class their place aided by the state. They ensured, open quote, that it was given every assistance in terms of funding and arms, turning a blind eye to its breaches of the law and, where necessary, covering its back through intervention by armed forces which, on the pretext of restoring order, would rush to the aid of the fascists wherever the latter were beginning to take a beating instead of doling one out, end quote. To quote Tobias Apse, open quote, the aims of the fascists and their backers amongst the industrialists and agrarians in 1921-1922 were simple, to break the power of the organized workers and peasants as completely as possible, to wipe out, with the bullet and the club, not only the gains of the Bienio Rosso, but everything that the lower classes had gained between the turn of the century and the outbreak of the First World War, end quote. The fascist squads attacked and destroyed anarchist and socialist meeting places, social centers, radical presses, and camera del lavoro, local trade union councils. However, even in the dark days of fascist terror, the anarchists resisted the forces of totalitarianism. Open quote. It is no coincidence that the strongest working class resistance to fascism was in towns or cities in which there was quite a strong anarchist syndicalist or anarcho syndicalist tradition. End quote. The anarchists participated in and often organized sections of the Arditi del Popolo, a working class organization devoted to the self defense of workers' interests. The Arditi del Popolo organized and encouraged working class resistance to fascist squads, often defeating larger fascist forces. For example, open quote, the total humiliation of thousands of Italo Balbo squadristi by a couple of hundred Arditi del Popolo backed by the inhabitants of the working class districts. End quote in the anarchist stronghold of Parma in August 1922. The Arditi del Popolo was the closest Italy got to the idea of a united, revolutionary working-class front against fascism, as had been suggested by Malatesta and the UAI. This movement, open quote, developed along anti-bourgeois and anti-fascist lines, and was marked by the independence of its local sections, end quote. Rather than being just an anti-fascist organization, the Arditi, open quote, were not a movement in defense of democracy in the abstract, but an essentially working class organization devoted to the defense of the interests of industrial workers, the dockers, and large numbers of artisans and craftsmen. End quote. Unsurprisingly, the Arditi del Popolo open quote, appear to have been strongest and most successful in areas where traditional working class political culture was less exclusively socialist and had strong anarchist or syndicalist traditions. For example, Bari. Livorno, Parma, and Rome, end quote. However, both the socialist and communist parties withdrew from the organization. The socialists signed a pact of pacification with the fascists in August 1921. The communists, open quote, preferred to withdraw their members from the Arditi del Popolo rather than let them work with the anarchists, end quote. Indeed, open quote, on the same day as the pact was signed, Ordine Nuovo published a PCDI, Communist Party of Italy, communication warning communists against involvement in the Arditi del Popolo. Four days later, the communist leadership officially abandoned the movement. Severe disciplinary measures were threatened against those communists who continued to participate in or liaise with the organization. Thus, by the end of the first week of August 1921, the PCI, CGL, and the PCDI had officially denounced the organization. Only the anarchist leaders, if not always sympathetic to the program of the Arditi del Popolo, did not abandon the movement. 
Indeed, Umanita Nova strongly supported it on the grounds it represented a popular expression of anti-fascist resistance and in defense of freedom to organize." End quote. However, in spite of the decisions by their leaders, many rank-and-file socialists and communists took part in the movement. The latter took part in, open quote, open defiance of the PCDI leadership's growing abandonment of it. In Turin, for example, communists who took part in the Arditi del Popolo did so less as communists and more as part of a wider working-class self-identification. This dynamic was reinforced by an important socialist and anarchist presence there. The failure of the communist leadership to support the movement shows the bankruptcy of Bolshevik organizational forms, which were unresponsive to the needs of the popular movement. Indeed, these events show the libertarian custom of autonomy from and resistance to authority was also operated against the leaders of the workers' movement, particularly when they were held to have misunderstood the situation at grassroots level. Thus, the Communist Party failed to support the popular resistance to fascism. The Communist leader Antonio Gramsci explained why, arguing that, open quote, the party leadership's attitude on the question of the Arditi del Popolo corresponded to a need to prevent the party members from being controlled by a leadership that was not the party's leadership. Gramsci added that this policy served to disqualify a mass movement which started from below and which could instead have been exploited by us politically. End quote. While being less sectarian towards the Arditi del Popolo than other communist leaders, open quote, in common with all communist leaders, Gramsci awaited the formation of the PCDI led military squads. End quote. In other words, the struggle against fascism was seen by the communist leadership as a means of gaining more members and, when the opposite was a possibility, they preferred defeat and fascism rather than risk their followers becoming influenced by anarchism. As Apse notes, open quote, it was the withdrawal of support by the socialist and communist parties at the national level that crippled the Arditi, end quote. Thus, open quote, Social reformist defeatism and communist sectarianism made impossible an armed opposition that was widespread and therefore effective, and the isolated instances of popular resistance were unable to unite in a successful strategy. And fascism could have been defeated. Insurrections at Sarzana in July 1921 and at Parma in August 1922 are examples of the correctness of the policies which the anarchists urged in action and propaganda." End quote. Historian Tobias Apse confirms this analysis, arguing that, open quote, what happened in Parma in August 1922 could have happened elsewhere if only the leadership of the socialist and communist parties thrown their weight behind the call of the anarchist Malatesta for a united revolutionary front against fascism, end quote. In the end, fascist violence was successful and capitalist power maintained, open quote. The anarchists' will and courage were not enough to counter the fascist gangs, powerfully aided with material and arms backed by the repressive organs of the state. Anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists were decisive in some areas and in some industries, but only a similar choice of direct action on the parts of the Socialist Party and the General Confederation of Labor, the reformist trade union, could have halted fascism." End quote. After helping to defeat the revolution, the Marxists helped ensure the victory of fascism. Even after the fascist state was created, anarchists resisted both inside and outside Italy. In America, for example, Italian anarchists played a major role in fighting fascist influence in their communities, none more so than Carlo Tresca, most famous for his role in the 1912 IWW Lawrence strike, who, open quote, in the 1920s, had no peer among anti-fascist leaders, a distinction recognized by Mussolini's political police in Rome." End quote. Many Italians, both anarchist and non-anarchist, traveled to Spain to resist Franco in 1936. See Umberto Marsocci's Remembering Spain, Italian Anarchist Volunteers in the Spanish War for details. During the Second World War, anarchists played a major part in the Italian partisan movement. It was the fact that the anti-fascist movement was dominated by anti-capitalist elements that led the USA and the UK to place known fascists in governmental positions in the places they liberated, often where the town had already been taken by the partisans, resulting in the Allied troops liberating the towns from its own inhabitants. 
Given this history of resisting fascism in Italy, it is surprising that some claim Italian fascism was a product or form of syndicalism. This is even claimed by some anarchists. According to Bob Black, the open quote, Italian syndicalists mostly went over to fascism, end quote. David D. Roberts' 1979 study, The Syndicalist Tradition and Italian Fascism, to support his claim. Peter Sabatini, in a review in Social Anarchism, makes a similar statement, saying that syndicalism's open quote, ultimate failure was its transformation into a vehicle of fascism, end quote. What is the truth behind these claims? Looking at Black's reference, we discover that, in fact, most of the Italian syndicalists did not go over to fascism, if by syndicalists we mean members of the USI, the Italian Syndicalist Union. Roberts states that, open quote, the vast majority of the organized workers failed to respond to the syndicalists' appeals and continued to oppose Italian intervention in the First World War, shunning what seemed to be a futile capitalist war. The syndicalists failed to convince even a majority within the USI. The majority opted for the neutralism of Armando Borghi, leader of the anarchists within the USI. Schism followed as Diambris led the interventionist minority out of the confederation." End quote. However, if we take syndicalist to mean some of the intellectuals and leaders of the pre-war movement, it was a case that the open quote, leading syndicalists came out for intervention quickly and almost unanimously, end quote, after the First World War started. Many of these pro-war leading syndicalists did become fascists. However, to concentrate on a handful of leaders, which the majority did not even follow, and state that this shows that the Italian syndicalists mostly went over to fascism staggers belief. What is even worse, as seen above, the Italian anarchists and syndicalists were the most dedicated and successful fighters against fascism. In effect, Black and Sabatini have slandered a whole movement. What is also interesting is that these leading syndicalists were not anarchists, and so not anarcho-syndicalists. As Robert Snow's open quote, in Italy, the syndicalist doctrine was more clearly the product of a group of intellectuals operating within the Socialist Party and seeking an alternative to reformism. They explicitly denounced anarchism and insisted on a variety of Marxist orthodoxy. The syndicalists genuinely desired and tried to work within the Marxist tradition. End quote. According to Carl Levy in his account of Italian anarchism, open quote, Unlike other syndicalist movements, the Italian variation coalesced inside a second international party. Supporters were partially drawn from socialist intransigence, the southern syndicalist intellectuals pronounced republicanism, another component was the remnant of the Partito Operaio. Unquote. In other words, the Italian syndicalists who turned to fascism were, firstly, a small minority of intellectuals who could not convince the majority within the syndicalist union to follow them, and secondly, Marxists and Republicans rather than anarchists, anarcho-syndicalists, or even revolutionary syndicalists. According to Carl Levy, Robert's book, open quote, concentrates on the syndicalist intelligentsia, and that some syndicalist intellectuals helped generate or sympathetically endorsed the new nationalist movement, which bore similarities to the populist and Republican rhetoric of the southern syndicalist intellectuals. He argues that there has been far too much emphasis on syndicalist intellectuals and national organizers, and that syndicalism relied little on its national leadership for its long-term vitality." End quote. If we do look at the membership of the USI, rather than finding a group which mostly went over to fascism, we discover a group of people who fought fascism tooth and nail and were subject to extensive fascist violence. To summarize, Italian fascism had nothing to do with syndicalism, and, as seen above, the USI fought the fascists and was destroyed by them along with the UAI, Socialist Party, and other radicals. That a handful of pre-war Marxist syndicalists later became fascists and called for a national syndicalism does not mean that syndicalism and fascism are related, any more than some anarchists later becoming Marxists makes anarchism a vehicle for Marxism. It is hardly surprising that anarchists were the most consistent and successful opponents of fascism. The two movements could not be further apart, one standing for total statism in the service of capitalism, while the other for free, non-capitalist society. Neither is it surprising that when their privileges and power were in danger, the capitalists and the landowners turned to fascism to save them. 
this process is a common feature in history. To list just four examples, Italy, Germany, Spain, and Chile.